What do you reckon comes up if you Google what's the worst way to spend your money? Well, I've just done it, and and it gives you some interesting results. According to Google, the worst things to spend your money on are convenience stores, mobile phone plans, soft drinks, bank fees, and magazines. Now, I agree that magazines probably aren't the smartest investment you could make, but I can't help but think we're missing something with this list. These purchases, they seem small, they seem incidental. I wanted to find out about common purchases that cost a lot of money, but don't boost our happiness. I wanted to find the worst ways to spend my money according to science. So I spent weeks studying the psychology behind money, and in this show, I'll walk through the actual worst ways to spend your money. And spoiler alert, it's not soft drinks or magazines. Researcher Elizabeth Dunn has compiled one of the largest research projects on money and happiness. For her book, Happy Money, she analysed 17,000 articles on the relationship between money and happiness and found that additional income provides surprisingly little additional happiness. That's right, additional income doesn't provide as much additional happiness as we might think. Now, this chimes with similar studies I've shared previously on Nudge. On an earlier episode titled, Can We Buy Happiness? I covered how to spend your money to actually try and buy happiness. The thing is, most of us don't follow the advice I shared on that podcast. We don't buy the things that bring us happiness. Instead, our spending leaves us pretty much as happy as we were before, or in some cases, even worse off. In fact, just having money, well, that can harm our mood. Although money can provide all sorts of wonderful things, from magazines to tasty soft drinks, wealth comes at a cost. Studies show that just thinking about cash can isolate us and harm our happiness. In one study, students received a big stack of Monopoly money and spent several minutes imagining a wealthy future. Other students were given no Monopoly money and spent that time thinking about their plans for the next day. Suddenly, a research assistant stumbled in front of them, spilling pencils everywhere. Here's what's interesting. In the variant of the study where the students had the stack of cash in front of them, they picked up fewer pencils than the variant where the students didn't have the cash in front of them. Even when wealth is hypothetical, it can change our behaviour. It makes us less helpful, which is paradoxical, of course, because helping others actually makes us happy. In another study, individuals who merely saw a photograph of money preferred solitary activities, choosing personal cooking classes over a catered dinner with friends. Money can and does isolate us, which in turn reduces our happiness. And here's what's strange. The more money we make, the less we enjoy the simple pleasures of life. So the more you make, the more income you make, the less you'll enjoy the little things that should bring all of us satisfaction. In a study of working adults in Belgium, wealthier individuals reported a lower likelihood to enjoy the simple pleasures in life. So, for example, they were less likely to say that they would pause to appreciate a beautiful waterfall on a hike or to stay present in the moment during a romantic weekend getaway. I think this explains why the relationship between income and happiness is much, much weaker than many people expect. While money can increase our happiness by giving us access to all sorts of wonderful things, knowing we have access to wonderful things raises our baseline and stops us from appreciating life's small joys. It's a really horrible loop. Before you're wealthy, you appreciate small things like a hike or a meal out. You decide, wow, I really enjoyed this. I want to experience it more. So you work more and make more money. And the more money you make, the more you're able to go on these hikes, the more you're able to have these meals out. But the more you do them and the, and the more available they are to you, the less you'll enjoy them. I think this is partly due to the scarcity bias. We enjoy things more when they are harder to get. When things are available in abundance, we enjoy them a lot less. For example, giving up chocolate for a period of time will make you enjoy it more. This is a reference to a great study in the book Happy Money. In the study, students are invited to a research room filled with chocolate. 
After an initial chocolate tasting, one group of students promised to abstain from chocolate for a week. Another group of students pledged to eat as much chocolate as they comfortably could during the week. They actually received a two-pound bag of chocolate to help them fulfill their pledge. Pretty cool study. <laughs> Go away and eat as much chocolate as you want. Now, conventional wisdom would suggest that the participants with a bag full of chocolate should be happier. They have more of the substance which brings them pleasure. But that chocolate abundance comes with a price. When they returned to the following week to sample additional chocolate, they enjoyed it much, much less than they had the week before. People only enjoyed chocolate the second week if they had abstained from it in between, if they'd given up chocolate in the week in between. So being rich, being wealthy makes everything more available. Buying two pounds of chocolate is no problem for someone who's got a lot of cash, but doing so will make you enjoy it less. I actually think this is how high-end brands prosper. This is how luxury brands prosper because they charge ridiculously high prices for their goods. And I think they do that not because their goods are worth that much money, but to give the rich people who can afford these things a hint of scarcity, to offer them something they know they couldn't get every day. Um, there's an example in London. Do you remember Salt Bay, the sort of meme Turkish chef who, who would sprinkle salt on his steaks? He opened a restaurant in London with obscene prices. He sold a golden giant tomahawk steak for £1,450. That's £1,450 for a steak. And a golden giant strip loin steak for £1,350. You know, ridiculous bills. And I think one of the reasons that people go here is not because they like the dishes, not because they think these dishes are the best steaks or best meals you could get in London. It's just so rich people can experience a little bit of scarcity. They just like to know that they can't buy that dish every day and that will make it taste better, just like the folks in the chocolate study who weren't able to eat chocolate every day of the week. So wealth decreases your happiness by making you fail to appreciate what you have not great. And unfortunately, it gets worse. Wealth also makes you feel like you have less time. That's right. Wealth makes you feel like you have less time. Here's what the research says. People who feel like they have plenty of free time are more likely to exercise. They are more likely to do volunteer work. They are more likely to participate in activities that are known to increase happiness. If you feel you have more free time, you are more likely to participate in activities that are known to increase happiness. Basically, we can assume that the more free time you have, the more happiness you should have. You might think that having a lot of money, having a lot of wealth can help you buy free time. You can pay for a nanny, a cleaner. You can uh, pay for a faster way to commute. However, rich people don't seem to feel like they have free time. In studies, wealthier individuals reported elevated levels of time pressure. In countries ranging from Germany to Korea, people who make more money say they feel more rushed. This holds true even after taking into account the number of hours they actually worked each week, both inside and outside the home. Around the world, wealthier individuals are more likely to say they feel stressed on any given day. And remember, in this study, they are waiting for the fact that they're comparing these people to other people who aren't as wealthy, who work just as much. And I think this is a weird paradox. The more money we have, the less free time we feel we have. And I, I want to reiterate this. I say feel because this view that they have less time might actually be subjective rather than objective. Despite feeling rushed, all of us actually have much more free time today, in 2023, than our previous generations did. In one study, researchers asked participants to record everything they did for all 1,440 minutes of a day. Comparing diaries written today to similar diaries written in the 1960s, the researchers discovered that people in the United States spent about four hours more engaging in leisure activities today than they did in the 1960s, while work hours have remained relatively constant. So we're working the same amount, but we're also getting more leisure time. So our sense today that we have less free time than ever before seems to be an illusion. We feel more rushed, even though technically we have more leisure time. What's weird though, is this effect becomes more pronounced the more money you make. In a study at the University of Toronto, students played the role of consultants, performing tasks for a fictitious company and billing their time in six-minute intervals. Half the students billed the company 
for 15 cents per minute, which is about $9 per hour, while the others, well, they build much, much more. They build $1.50 per minute, which is $60 an hour. So some are billing for $9 an hour, some are billing for $60 an hour. Here's the interesting part. The students who build the company at the higher rate reported feeling more pressed for time, even though they had completed the same tasks in the same amount of time as the students who build for the lower rate. Remember, the only difference between the groups was how much they charged. They did the same task, and yet the students charging more felt like they had less time. If this finding is true, it suggests that the more you make, the more rushed you'll feel. And because our incomes have risen over the past hundred years, maybe each generation has felt more and more rushed. Simply getting paid a higher salary makes us feel under more time pressure, harming our happiness. Now, everything I've covered up to now looks at the effects wealth can have on us, and largely that effect can be negative. But as always, I really want to clarify and put a disclaimer here. I'm talking about very high levels of wealth, the top 10 or maybe even 5% of the global population. For the majority of the world, lack of wealth is a real problem that will debilitate happiness. But today we are covering what happens to those with high levels of wealth, and the finding is clear. Having wealth definitely won't guarantee happiness, and in some cases, it harms your well-being. In the second half of the show, we'll get into how some purchases can be more detrimental to your happiness than others, and we'll answer what the worst ways to spend your money are. So Google told me the worst thing for me to spend my money on was a magazine. And I wasn't too impressed by this. How is a magazine going to seriously impact my happiness? It's such a small incidental purchase. I wanted to know how a much larger once-in-a-lifetime purchase could affect my well-being. Things like buying a house. So I did some digging. Now, there are some eye-opening studies on how moving house affects our happiness. The research actually surprised me. Between 1991 and 2007, researchers tracked thousands of people in Germany who moved to a new house because there was something about their old house that they didn't like. So these are people who aren't moving just because they're maybe making more money. They're moving because they actually don't like or they don't like an aspect of their old house. Immediately after setting into their new homes, these movers reported being much more satisfied with their new homes than they had been with their old ones. Great news, right? Spending all that money to move, all that time to move, it did make people more satisfied with their new home. But there's a catch. These movers adapted to their new surroundings much faster than expected. The research shows that people often get used to whatever they've got. Now, while movers' satisfaction with their homes increased, their life satisfaction and their overall happiness didn't improve at all. So these movers, yes, they're satisfied with their home, but there was no noticeable difference in life satisfaction. Which is a bit weird, right? You'd expect a purchase like this, which is easily one of the biggest purchases a family can make. You'd expect it to boost happiness, but it had no notable impact. It begs the question, is moving home all it's cracked up to be? Should we move? Even if there's something wrong with our current house that we don't like? Or should we spend that money on perhaps something more fulfilling? In the UK, the average house move costs £1,177,000. And that's just the immediate cost. It doesn't take into account the increased interest rates you'll be paying and the increased mortgage rates you'll be paying as well. This research actually suggests that you might be better off spending that sum of money on something else. Or you might be tempted to spend it on a new fancy car. But hold on because researchers have studied driver's life satisfaction too. Researchers at the University of Michigan asked students to predict how much pleasure they would experience while driving different cars. On offer were some cheap cars, some mid-range cars, and some expensive cars, a BMW, for example. The students consistently said that they would derive much more pleasure from driving the BMW. But do drivers actually experience more happiness behind the wheel of an expensive car? Well, to find out, the Michigan researchers asked actual car owners to think back on the last time they had driven the car and rate how much they enjoyed that drive. So it's a good study because they're actually asking car owners to, to think about when they're using the car rather than just thinking about the car in abstract. Although the cars ranged widely in value from $400 to $40,000, there was no 
relationship at all between the market value of the car and the amount of enjoyment the owners got from driving it that day or whenever they last drove it. So let me repeat that, no relationship at all. Some people choose to spend a vast amount of money, a vast amount of their disposable income on flashy cars. And many of us choose to invest in cars despite knowing they have little resale value as well. And we tell ourselves we do this because we think it'll make us happier. But the research suggests that you'd be just as happy with an old banger as you would be in a BMW. An expensive car, for most people, is quite clearly a bad use of your money. Now, some of you listening probably have just moved house, perhaps moved to the suburbs, and and perhaps you've upgraded your car to a nice BMW. Well, unfortunately, I've got a bit more bad news for you, because if you have moved to a house that has increased the length of your commute, then your happiness might be taking a hit. This is because most of us hate commuting, and it's a real problem, because we spend a lot of our time commuting. In the US, people spend more time commuting than their typical annual leave. So that's two weeks a year getting to and from work commuting. They spend more time doing that than they actually do on holiday. And in both the US and in France, women report being in an unpleasant mood most while commuting. For them, commuting is worse than any other activity. When compared to other tasks, commuting is ranked as probably the worst activity in terms of its satisfaction, in terms of how it impacts life satisfaction as well. According to Michael Norton and Elizabeth Dunn, taking a job that requires an hour-long commute each day has a negative effect on happiness that is similar in magnitude to not having a job at all. So not good news for those with a commute, but it it actually gets a bit worse because individuals with long commutes, well, they're much less satisfied with the free time they have, with their spare time. The average US household devotes almost 20% of their income to driving expenses, and that percentage climbs as high as 40% for low-income households. But this obsession with cars is, you know, largely irrational. In a 2011 study comparing almost 300 commuters traveling from their homes in northern New Jersey to their jobs in New York City, people felt significantly less stressed and disgruntled after taking the train rather than driving. Train travel, at least for this study, was less effortful and more predictable than driving. And remember, these commuters had the option to take the train or drive, And yet still, the drivers, perhaps due to the sunk cost of their car investment, were willing to take a less satisfying form of transport. Of course, not all of us can pick our commute. Many of us have no choice but to drive. But before you move to the suburbs or away from reliable public transport, take a moment to consider your happiness. All right, I'm going to stop bashing cars. I should reiterate, of course, that this will not be the case for everyone. Some car lovers out there will get untold pleasure from driving, and other countryside fanatics will rave about their move out of the city. This research doesn't discredit that. It just says, on average, people see a drop in their life satisfaction with these activities. Now, enough about what we do outside of the home, though. Let's talk about some of the purchases we make for our home. Purchases like TV. The average Brit spends the equivalent of two months a year watching television. In many countries, people spend almost as much time watching TV as they do working. Of course, now the way we consume media is changing. Many choose to watch on tablets, laptops and phones. And perhaps you're not watching you know, traditional TV. Perhaps you're watching YouTube or Netflix. But still, the majority of homes in the UK have a TV. And TV usage is still on the rise and has been growing year on year for decades. So... Is this obsession with telly good for us? Well, as you can probably guess, no, it's not. Study after study show that people experience less pleasure while watching TV than while engaging in more active forms of leisure, like walking a dog or simply just walking to the shops. But what's worse, TV actually takes all the fun out of our free time. Although people today spend less time doing unpleasant tasks like household chores, television has sucked up much of this newly available time while providing us with very little life satisfaction. In a sample of over 100,000 people from 32 European countries, individuals who watch more than 30 minutes of television per day were less satisfied with their lives than people who watched TV for under half an hour. So just a general study that shows life satisfaction does seem to correlate with how much TV you're watching. Liz Dunn and Michael Norton state in Happy Money that watching the occasional TV show may genuinely be enjoyable, but devoting two months of your year to television is clearly too much. Just like the students in the chocolate study, we could instantly gain much more enjoyment from television if we limited our access. 
just keeping the telly off for one night a week is enough to boost happiness. So moving house, buying an expensive car, and getting a bigger TV, these seem like purchases that aren't going to bring you much joy. But it's not just about what you buy, it's also about how you buy. See, deciding to spend with either cash, debit, or a credit card can dramatically change how much you spend. When students had the opportunity to bid on a pair of tickets to a sold-out sporting event, those told they would have to pay with actual cash bid an average of $28 for the tickets. So when they're told they have to bid with cash, they bid $28. And I should say, they only needed to make the bid on the following day, so they had plenty of time to go to a cash machine and get the cash out if needed. In the study, there was a, a variant group of students who were told that they could use credit cards to pay for the tickets, to bid for the tickets. And on average, they bid more than double. They bid an average of $60 compared to $28. So they're bidding twice as much just because they're allowed to use a credit card. These students are not financially naive, they were MBA students, and it shows that we spend a lot more when we have a credit card at hand. But not only do we spend more of credit cards, we also forget how much we've spent as well. When researchers asked 30 people to estimate their credit card expenses before opening their monthly bill, every single individual underestimated the spend on average by almost 30%. So we're underestimating how much we spend on credit cards. I couldn't find studies to see if we're doing the same with cash, but there is of course a problem with underestimating how much we spend on credit cards, which is debt. The average American household has a credit card debt of $5,768 in 2021. And if there's one thing that will definitely decrease your happiness, it's debt. Almost half of US residents report worrying about their debts. Although the relationship between income and happiness is fairly weak among Americans, there is a much stronger relationship between individuals' happiness and whether they have difficulty paying their bills. Our levels of debt are a much bigger predictor of happiness than our actual salary. This is the case in Britain too. Households with more debt exhibit clear lower happiness. Debt is particularly detrimental for marriages as well. Married couples with higher levels of debt show increased levels of marital conflict. If you're looking for a bad way to spend your money, spending it on anything that puts you in debt is almost certainly a bad decision. If possible, you should avoid debt at all. And obviously that's almost impossible for a lot of purchases like university, like buying a house. But it is possible to not use things like credit cards and pay later apps. While it might feel good in the moment to get your goods without spending, it'll cause more detriment to your happiness as time goes on. So the solution is just pay with a debit card. A large US study found that debit card users had almost 400% less unsecured debt than people who didn't use debit cards, even after taking into account personal characteristics such as income and credit. So we've covered how money affects us. We've covered the worst things to buy and why you should not use credit. But let's finish with a look at how we get our money. Could the way we're paid alter our happiness? This final study looks at individuals who received an hourly wage versus those who received an annual salary. Hourly workers, from entry-level shop assistants to high-earning accountants, are more inclined to give up additional time in exchange for additional money than those who were paid annually. In a national survey of Americans, 32% of people paid by the hour reported that they would trade more time for more money whereas only 17% of the non-hourly workers found this trade-off appealing. Even if you're no longer paid by the hour, your past experience with hourly payments may still influence you. The effect of being paid by the hour apparently takes around two years to wear off. As well as propelling people to work more, hourly payments can reduce individuals' willingness to engage in activities that are emotionally but not financially rewarding. Hourly workers are less likely to participate in volunteer work. This phenomenon holds true even after taking into account other differences between hourly and non-hourly workers. In the book Happy Money, the authors state that seeing time and money as interchangeable resources is wise from an economic perspective, but counterproductive from a happiness perspective. Hourly workers end up viewing life through a different lens, focusing on time as an opportunity to make money rather than a chance to enjoy life. This focus appears to harm happiness on average. Okay, I think many of you listening to this podcast might disagree with some of these points. You probably have examples in your head that contradict these points. But there is one obvious point I want all of us to take away, and that is that spending your money won't guarantee happiness. That is simply not how it works. 
If you're unhappy and you're trying to spend your way out of your emotional rut, then you'll probably end up in a worse place. This is because paying for things, well, it can genuinely hurt us. Seriously, thinking about price is painful. In a study at Stanford University, participants went shopping from inside a brain scanner. So they were inside a brain scanner, but they could use a computer to view different products. And on the computer, desirable products, including fancy chocolates, popped up on the screen, followed by the price of that chocolate. And then people could decide whether to purchase each product. Here's what happened. When participants viewed the desirable products, their brains showed an activation in the nucleus accumbens, the brain region linked with positive anticipation. But when the price appeared, their brains exhibited activation in the insula, a neural region that responds to diverse forms of impending pain. So <laughs> you see the product and you're, you're excited, there's positive anticipation being generated. You see the price and you feel impending pain. Thinking about price causes pain. And on that note, I guess there's one final takeaway. Rather than asking ourselves, what's the worst thing to spend money on? Maybe we should ask ourselves, should we spend this money at all? All right, folks, that is all for today. Thank you so much for listening. Now, I need to give a huge shout out to one book um, when rounding up the show today because it was easily the number one source material that I used for this episode. The book is Happy Money by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. It is a brilliant book that looks at the psychology behind money and how spending it in the right way will improve your happiness. Most of the studies I've cited today are from that book. So if you like this show, you'll love that book. Just search Happy Money wherever you get your books. And again, if you have enjoyed the today's show uh, and you want to hear more, then please do go sign up to my newsletter. If you do, you'll get an email from me every time a new show goes live, so you won't miss a show, but you'll also get a nudge tip each week, a behavioral science tip on all sorts of things from how to grow your business to how to spend your money more wisely. So go to nudgepodcast.com and click newsletter in the menu. That's nudgepodcast.com and click newsletter in the menu to sign up. If you want, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm P underscore Agnew. That's P underscore A-G-N-E-W. I share a bunch of tips, just like the ones you hear on the show, on my account. And you can follow me on LinkedIn as well. I'm Phil Agnew on there. Do go on there and say hi. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back with another episode of Nudge next Monday.